Good afternoon and welcome to the College of Engineering virtual brown bag series. Uh, as you know, uh, we have been conducting this series of a variety of talks since the beginning of the semester. And on Friday, uh, we focus on faculty and alumni research in engineering and applied uh, research. Engineering in action, in other words. And today's talk features a faculty member from our computer science engineering department who will be talking about a topic of general interest, we hope. I'm Dr. Lynn Peterson. I'm Associate Dean of Engineering here at UT Arlington. And on behalf of the entire College of Engineering, we want to welcome you to this series. Our speaker for today is Dr. Ming Li, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science Engineering. Her research interests are mobile computing and Internet of Things, including their novel application to smart living, to smart cities, to smart health, and their relationship to security and privacy issues. She's a prolific publisher um, and also the recipient of a couple of very prestigious Young Faculty Awards, the NSFCRII, and the Career in 2020. She's a member of the both organizations, IEEE and ACM, that are relevant to this program. Her PhD is in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Mississippi State. And the topic for today is a really interesting one that focuses on a piece of her research, improving mobility of visually impaired people in outdoor environments. So for our participants, um, those those viewing the, uh, the presentation today, I'd like to remind you that there is a chat function that you have access to. And after her presentation, we'll be accessing the questions and I'll be asking those questions for you. So please make use of that opportunity and uh, let's do a little bit of interaction on this very interesting topic. So Ming, thank you so much for being with us today and I'll turn things over so you can talk to us about improving mobility in visually impaired people in outdoor environments. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction from Dr. Peterson. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Ming Li. I am now an assistant professor from Computer Science and uh, Engineering Department. Uh, today, um, it's my great pleasure to share some of my research on how to improve the mobility for uh, the people with uh, visual impairments, uh, especially for the outdoor environment. So um, individuals primarily rely on vision to know their own position and the direction in the environment. Recognizing various kinds of um, uh, elements or, uh, uh, or obstacles in their surroundings. Um, a lack of uh, vision heavily impacts those these tasks, um, requiring a conscious effort to integrate the perceptions from remaining sensory modalities like memories. Um, here are some uh, mobility challenges for the blind people, uh, the common challenges that they may, they may encounter in their daily life, such as uh, static obstacles, uh, potholes in the walkways, moving objects nearby, um, navigate from location one to location B and to cross the streets. The obstacles include rocks, bottles, potted plants, parked bicycles, scooters. When encountering with these obstacles, visually impaired people must rely on their experience to react 
because they may not know what kind of uh, obstacles exactly. Um, some obstacles on the road cannot be predicted, such as parked bicycles or a resting dog. Uh, another mobility challenge is imposed by the moving objects nearby, such as other pedestrians or scooters that move pretty fast in the walkway or, uh, or crosswalks. Uh, we may have the impression that the sighted pedestrians are aware of the blind people and they will clear the way for them. Um, unfortunately, this is not always the case as sighted people may be looking at their smartphones, uh, talking with others or even looking at another direction. So in these scenarios, blind people face significant risks of uh, collision. Um, for crossing streets, then the court has ex uh, actually uh, to decide when it is safe to cross the streets or an intersection. Uh, right now, they mostly rely on the traffic lights or regular uh, regulation traffic infrastructures together with their hearings to make a judgment. Um, as we'll mention later, that these approaches are not reliable as the infrastructures just does not exist in many cases. And uh, according to the World Report on Vision from WHO, published in 2019, at least 2.2 billion have a vision impairment or blind, blindness. So we call this group of people as vibe people globally. So how to improve the mobility experience for this group of people deserves some investigation. So what are the common solutions? Um, traditionally, the white people use the guide canes to detect obstacles in front of them. Um, and in the environment that uh, unfamiliar environment, they may ask for help, uh, helps from the volunteers nearby. Um, and uh, they cannot entirely depend on guide cane to become familiar with their surroundings or react quickly to unforeseen circumstances. Um, guide dogs are great helpers too. Um, their role is to guide the blind to avoid various obstacles. Um, Meanwhile, with a lot of movies and online videos about guide dogs, we may have the wrong impression that uh, guide dogs can't do everything and we can fully rely on them. Um, unfortunately, dogs are red, green, colorblind and incapable of interpreting traffic signals. Um, so it is still the pedestrian, the, the blind, to uh, to do the directing, to find the navigation, to know how to go to uh, one place to another. And the dog's role is pretty simple. It just tried to avoid the obstacles in the roads picked by the pedestrian. And uh, dogs don't know how to get from location A to location B. They don't know when it is safe to cross the street either. Um, and at the same time, they cannot protect the vibe people from collision, from unexpected moving uh, objects. Uh, in other words, what dogs can do uh, is rather limited. So um, nowadays, people are talking about uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Um, at the same time, most blind people still use the wood or plastic sticks and uh, guiding, uh, guidance animals to walk around. So there is a huge gap here. Luckily, there have been, uh, there, there have been some research that aims to develop assistive uh, technology to improve the mobility for the Vive people. For example, the sensors such as uh, depth camera, general camera, radio frequency, ultrasonic sensors, infrastructure sens uh, infrared sensors are integrated to the white cane, to the regular white cane, um, so as to avoid the obstacles or to detect and avoid the obstacles nearby. Um, and besides, GPS modules are also proposed to add to enable outdoor navigation. 
And uh, we call those enhanced uh, white cane as smart cane. Uh, recently, a smart cane product called WeWalk has been developed by a startup company. Um, this smart cane can be considered as the modification of conventional white cane, but integrated with ultrasonic sensors. Um, at the same time, also equipped with uh, wireless communication modules so that it can talk, can, uh, can talk to the smartphone. And specifically, the WeWalk used the acoustic, uh, the, the ultrasonic sensor to sense the surrounding obstacles. And if uh, a, a generate a, a alert will be generated if some obstacles nearby are detected. And at the same time, it also user, uh, allows the user to access navigation through Google Map and the voice assistance so that they can ask for directions and be guided to the nearest, for example, uh, coffee shop or restaurant. Um, although WeWalk is a pretty nice tool, um, as I list the price here, it costs around $450. So it's expensive and sometimes probably not affordable uh, by uh, the blind people who happen to belong to low income group at the same time, or in many cases. So um, observing these limitations, what my lab intends to do is to develop assistive tools that are economical for the vibe people. Instead of using any sophisticated sensors, our approach relies on the smartphones. Um, it leverages the smartphone's existing hardware. Users just need to download and install the app, and uh, then that's it. Um, at the same time, we are interested in addressing the mobility challenges that have not been well investigated yet. So nowadays, smartphones are equipped with various sensors. Um, we've got a thermometer. If you have a chance to leave your phone outside in the sun, probably it will turn off automatically uh, because of overheat. Uh, this is because the thermometer keeps on monitoring the internal temperature of the smartphone. Um, whenever the reading is uh, beyond a certain threshold, then it triggers the smartphones to turn off. We've also got the proximity sensor. Um, this is what keeps you from accidentally pressing the buttons with your cheeks during the phone call. Uh, we also have um, uh, Bluetooth. We also have uh, uh, microphone and the cameras on the smartphone. So with various kinds of sensors equipped, um, the smartphone can actually capture a rich information of surrounding environment. Then can we leverage the sensing capability of the smartphones um, to improve the mobility, the, to improve the mobility for the vibe people. So in the following, I plan to introduce one of ongoing projects from my lab. Uh, it is supported by CTED. We aim to develop a smartphone app that assists pedestrians with vision impairment to cross uncontrolled streets. Uh, the app alerts the pedestrians with presence of oncoming vehicles that may cause hazard. So how to navigate the vibe people to cross streets is actually a long lasting topic. The state of art solution is to install the traffic lights and uh, uh, accessible pedestrian signals, or we just call it APS, at intersections or crossing sections to assist the visually impaired in, the, uh, in deciding whether it is safe to cross. So with a traffic light, they can hear when traffic moving on the street in front of them uh, begins to slow down and uh, eventually comes to a stop then this indicates that they have the green light and it is okay to cross. Besides, some intersections are even equipped with the APS. 
Um, if you notice that we have the APS in storage um, um, outside of the campus, north of the campus, in the streets north of the campus. So the APS emit some uh, beep or chirp signals or can be just a human voice um, so that the blind person knows which street has the green light and know whether it is safe to cross the street now. However, there are even more uncontrolled crosswalks where no traffic control exists at all. And uh, by um, uncontrolled crosswalks means there's no traffic lights, no APS, or even without any stop signs. And these common crossing types occur at non-intersections or mid-block locations where they may be marked or not. And they typically exist in residential communities, local streets, suburban areas. So in these areas, um, sophisticated traffic infrastructures are just too expensive to fully deploy around those areas. So in these road sections, the visually impaired have to mostly depend on themselves, more specifically relying on their hearings to decide whether it is safe to proceed to the street. In practice, um, they need to distinguish from the traffic sounds whether the vehicle is too far away to cause any hazard or they are within the proximity area. However, hearing-based judgment is not always reliable. First of all, hearing capability varies from person to person. Generally, young people have more sensitive hearing compared with seniors. Um, and besides, the environmental conditions may affect the traffic sounds. Like the rain, the wind may enhance or distort the sounds, and the snow can muffle the sounds. And also the background infrastructure sound, uh, the, the background infrastructure um, and even the uh, people nearby their, their talk nearby may just uh, cover or even overwhelm the traffic sound. So all these factors render the hearing-based judgment not that reliable. So what we do is to develop an app. So whenever a pedestrian senses a clear street and tends to cross, proceed to the crosswalk, she can turn on the app that we develop and to double check, to double confirm her judgment to see whether indeed the, the, the street is clear. If yes, then it is okay for her to proceed to the street. If no, then our app generates alarm indicating that um, the pedestrian should wait at the curb until the street becomes clear. So to achieve this goal, it is essential to figure out the moving status of each vehicle nearby. Notice that there might be several vehicles, right? Then we need to figure out the moving status for each vehicle nearby. And these moving status can be characterized, for example, their velocity, their moving speed, and their distance to the pedestrian, and so on. So in order to uh, measure these parameters, in order to obtain those parameters, our idea is to leverage acoustic sensing. Um, so our system consists of two parts. The first part is um, a portable speaker that is mounted outside of the vehicle. And the second part is the smartphone, which is installed with the app that we developed. So we have the speaker to emit some acoustic sound ranging between 17 kilohertz to 19 kilohertz. We pick this range because the sound within this range is out of the hearing range of the human being. So it is imperceptible by pedestrians, by the humans. So that's great. And at the same time, these signals can be captured by the microphone on the smartphone. Then our app can analyze the receive the signals and then to make the detection. So this is the basic idea of how it works. So in our experiment, we use the speaker 
just the regular speaker, the commercial off the shelf speaker that costs around twenty dollars. So that is pretty uh, pretty cheap and affordable. And besides, the reason we utilize acoustic sensing over other sense uh, sensory modalities uh, due to several reasons. First of all, acoustic signals can propagate around the obstructions through diffraction on the edge of the uh, obstruction or reflected at the surface of the, uh, of the object. This property is very important because it supports the measuring vehicles behind the obstructions. Sometimes the pedestrians may stand behind the tree. So there is a tree standing between the pedestrian and the vehicle. So in this case, if the signal is blocked by the tree, then it will impact the measurement, the detection result. But for acoustic signals, as they can propagate around the obstruction, then we don't have this issue. And the second reason is that the performance of acoustic ranging is not depend on lightning conditions of the environment and is also effective uh, in the darkness. So if we use a camera to detect the, uh, the vehicles nearby, then the performance will be degraded significantly uh, in the evenings or at night. But for acoustic sensing, for acoustic ranging, we don't have such issue. So the design rationale can be described as follows. Um, the white can, first of all, the white can law gives the visually impaired pedestrians the right of way in crosswalks. Whether or not the, crest, the crosswalks are, <coughs> sorry, are marked or not. And the law requires the drivers to stop their vehicle and yield to the blind who is crossing the street. And here, the distance that the vehicle travels before complete stop is called SSD. SSD is short for stopping sight distance. It is near the worst case distance that the driver needs to see in order to have room to react and stop the car completely. So if the instance distance between the vehicle and the pedestrian is larger, then this SSD, then we consider that, okay, th this driver has sufficient time to react and stop the car completely before colliding into the pedestrian. Or in another word, it is safe for the pedestrian to proceed to the crosswalk. So this is actually um, the decision criteria of the app. But the core task here is first of all, to measure the distance between the vehicle and the pedestrian. And secondly, the moving speed of the vehicle. So these are the core parameters that we need to measure. But the challenge is that we need to measure those parameters at the smartphone without any communication between the vehicle and the smartphone. So this figure, um, outlines the system architecture design. Um, as you can see, it is composed of several signal processing modules. Um, as I mentioned, the main challenge is um, to characterize the moving status of each vehicle. And secondly, given there, that there might be multiple vehicles nearby, we need to differentiate uh, among the vehicles. So one of the key ingredients, uh, ingredients is to decide if the vehicle cause potential hazard is to figure out its velocity. A straightforward solution is to analyze the Doppler frequency shift of the received chirps at the receiver. This task is easy if there's only one vehicle nearby. In our case, oftentimes several vehicles are present. So their emitted sounds overlap rendering distinguishing among them an extremely task, let alone analyzing the frequency shift for velocity estimation. Meanwhile, we notice that when the vehicle have different moving speed, distance, uh, relative um, uh, angle to the pedestrian, the signal received at a smartphone would be different. 
So we then carry out the time frequency analysis over the received signal and infer the vehicle's moving status. So in this talk, I don't plan to dig into the technical details, but I just uh, list the uh, system architecture, the framework. And here I'd like to mention um, some preliminary results we have. First of all, the ranging distance can be as far as 200 feet. The ranging distance means the, the furthest distance that the app can detect the existence of a vehicle. Um, and, um, and the tool delivers the best detection performance when the vehicle's moving speed is between 10 to 30 miles per hour. So if the vehicle is within this range, then our performance, we, we can achieve the best performance. If the vehicle is lower than the speed or higher than this speed range, then the performance will experience some uh, degradation. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, um, although the best performance is achieved between 10 to 30 miles per hour uh, speed, I'd like to mention that in an interview with some uh, blind volunteers in the experiment, they mentioned that they would never travel alone for the streets have a speed limit higher than 40 mile, 45 miles per hour. It's just unsafe. They are just feel unsafe and uncomfortable to travel alone. So I think that's also um, uh, the the reason that we uh, it's, it's okay for us to have a very the very good performance within the range of uh, between 10 to 30 uh, miles per hour speed. And besides the performance, uh, uh, here are some uh, uh, metric for the best performance. It's MDR. MDR means the missed detection rate is as low as 3.4 uh, percent, and the force alarm rate is as low as 3.2 uh, percent. So the missed detection rate means uh, the vehicle can cause hazard to the pedestrian. However, it is not correctly detected. So that's called missed detection. And on the other hand, the force alarm means um, the vehicle will not cause any hazard and it is safe to for the pedestrian to cross to the street however the app generates a force alarm so as you can see for well, both uh, parameters the it, it's relatively low and it's uh, um, uh, it's pretty encouraging especially considering that this is just some prelim preliminary result okay um, I think that's uh, all the slides that I have, and uh, I'm now ready for taking any questions that you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That, that was that is quite an interesting uh, area of re of research. We have a couple of questions that relate directly to the uh, the presentation. So let me let me go ahead and ask those first. Um, you mentioned the best performance of the app exists when the vehicle's speed is between 10 and 30 miles an hour. Could you say a, a, a little bit more about why that is? Yes, sure. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, the reason we have this result is actually uh, due to the signal processing techniques adopted by this tool. Um, so first of all, the analysis is done over consecutive samples measured. Um, to achieve an accurate analysis, it is desirable that two measured signals, two consecutive signals are distinguishable uh, or distinguish where from each other. So if the vehicle moves too slow, then the difference between the consecutive samples would be negligible. So that would lead to some uh, error in the um, ultimate measurement. So this is the reason why a too slow speed does not work. Um, and on the other hand, if the vehicle moves too fast, 
then the number of samples we can extract from the ranging distance becomes smaller too. So for a ranging distance, it, it is the longest distance that the app can detect the existence of the vehicle. So if the car moves too fast, then the number of samples we can collect within this ranging distance is limited. So this also caused some uh, measurement degradation uh, of the app. Yeah, hope that uh, answers. Good, thank, thank you very much. Um, and then one other just point of clarification, I guess. What is the main difference between your app and the WeWalk, the uh, smart cane example that you had in the slide? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, so for WeWalk, um, first of all, um, it, it tries to resolve two problems. The first one is um, collision detection and collision avoidance. Uh, and besides, the so it, sorry, it's not collision, it's uh, obstacle detection and uh, obstacle avoidance. And besides, the obstacles are static obstacles. So they focus on like trees, potted plants, uh, or like, or parked bicycle scooters or some resting dog. So the, this is one of the focus. They want to detect the static obstacles and try to avoid them. And another goal of that smart cane is that um, they try to provide the navigation for the blind. Um, and to do this, they integrate a wireless communication module to the smart cane so that it can connect to the smartphone. So they actually access the Google map in the smartphone via the uh, via the uh, Bluetooth module, so that the Google Map can provide a step by step navigation through uh, through the smart cane through the uh, WeWalk smart cane. So these are the two goals that they aim to achieve. Uh, while in our tool, uh, first of all, we intend to address the issue of how to uh, uh, to assist the pedestrian to decide when it is safe to cross the street. Um, so to do this, we need to measure the moving status of all the vehicles nearby. So the vehicles are definitely like dynamic, dynamic. they're non-static. So it renders the problem more challenging. Yeah. And we need to estimate the distance with the vehicles. We need to estimate the instant moving speed and also relative angle angles to the pedestrians. So I guess that's the um, and that's the one of the difference between these two. And besides, I'd like to mention is they actually developed a new hardware, which is a, a the to modify the existing white cane, uh, white cane with the ultrasonic sensor and also add with the wireless communication module. However, we just leverage the smartphone, the the existing hardware on the smartphone. So we don't need to add, we don't need to add any extra sensors. So that could be another difference between these two. Any new equipment? Yeah, good. And uh, let me remind our listeners that you can pose your own questions uh, by writing them in the chat. So we'll we'll uh, uh, be accessing those as soon as you present them. So um, perhaps one other area. Um, uh, as the since the computation is done on the smartphone for your your app, is there, there any significant computation delay? Um, yes. Given mm -hmm. the limited resource computation resource of the smartphone. Thanks a lot for the question, uh, which is um, which the, the computation delay is definitely something we need to care about, especially if it is for mobility for the blind people to detect if any vehicles would cause any potential ha uh, hazard. Uh, we have done some uh, preliminary uh, tests and we find that the the delay, the computation delay uh, caused by our algorithm caused by the app is at a level of hundreds of uh, milliseconds, which is, I think it's around 200 or so milliseconds. So I would say that is a practically acceptable um, computation delay 
um, especially if we consider the vehicles are moving with uh, with moderate speed, say between 10 and 30 miles per per, uh, per hour. And another direction that we can improve this computation delay or like to further reduce the computation delay is we can adopt some other advanced com uh, computation techniques such as parallel uh, computing. Mm -hmm. Right now, all the uh, signal processing modules are processed one by one in the sequential manner. So if we can parallel, uh, uh, parallelize those uh, process, it will improve the performance uh, of the computation delay too. A lot of things to look into. This is yes. really a, a very, a very fertile area. That's that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, do vehicles directly send messages to the smartphones uh, nearby regarding their presence? Can okay. can that be done, or is that being done? Yes. Um, thank you. So. Um, in our case, in our case, we don't have direct communication mm -hmm. employed between the smartphone and the vehicles. Instead, we just have the vehicle to emit some acoustic signal, and then the smartphone works as a standalone mode um, to capture those signal and to analyze the signal, and then to infer the moving status of the vehicle. And at the same time, I do want to mention that recently there is very hot topic, which is about V2X. V2X means um, they, they try to build communication between the vehicle and anything else. The anything else include the smartphone at the pedestrian and also like the traffic lights. Um, anything with the wireless communication uh, module, including the roadside unit and other vehicles. Uh, but still, um, they this this V2X communication requires that both parties are installed with some dedicated communication modules to realize the the direct talk, the direct conversation. Um, I know that uh, Honda actually initiated such kind of project uh, one or two years ago. Um, also, they tried to leverage the V2X communication to improve or to enhance, uh, to protect the pedestrian from the nearby vehicle, the collision. Um, however, I think they still rely on some dedicated communication module. They need to integrate those modules to the smartphone. Um, otherwise, it is impossible for these two parties to talk to each other right now. So, um, although there have been some protocols for uh, to support V2X communication, uh, to my knowledge, um, the current smartphones are not um, installed with those modules. And there's no clear roadmap uh, like when those modules will be integrated to the smartphones. Um, so I would say V2X um, has attracted uh, great attention and uh, it is proposed to install those modules to some of the vehicles, but whether or not those um, those modules will be integrated to the smartphone, that's a different uh, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know whether um, whether uh, the the next question is something that um, you have already worked out, but what is the target price for the device? Um, the target. Uh, yeah. So first of all, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. first of all, we don't uh, build any new hardware or new device for this. What we do is just to simply build an app, to develop an app to receive the signals. So um, we just leverage the existing hardware on the smartphone without introducing any sensor, any extra sensor. Uh, but at the same time, we do require that the vehicles are, they can put some portable speaker in front of them. Um, and the, in the experiment, the speaker costs around twenty twenty dollars, around twenty dollars. So that's uh, that's much cheaper compared with we walk the smart walk, which costs around four hundred and fifty dollars. 
Um, so uh, I guess a big advantage of our app is that um, it does not cost any extra uh, money at the side of the pedestrian. OK, good. This is, a, in a sense, a two part question. Um, a major problem you discussed with the current accessibility mechanisms is lack of infrastructure. This app would require all vehicles to have a speaker attached. If not, a, a VIB person could falsely assume safety to cross the street. Um, and the question was, how would the app account for this? But then to clarify that question, um, is any redundancy being considered using a different sensor, such as the camera, to register any vehicles that may not have this, a speaker or one that is malfunctioning? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question, and, and I would like to address it from uh, several aspects. So first of all, the functionality of the tool does not require all vehicles to participate. Um, it can perform the collision detection only to the participatory ones. So in the worst case that none of the vehicles near the pedestrian vicinity opt in, then the scenario just degrade to the hearing based, the conventional hearing based uh, judgment scenario. So the tool will not perform worse than the current solution. And the second thing is that um, this is just an assistive tool. And uh, it is still the, uh, the pedestrian's liability to make a decision whether it is OK to cross to the street. So our app just provides an extra layer of protection. So this is the second point. And besides, actually, we are thinking of uh, to convert um, to um, actually to uh, leverage the speaker on the smartphone instead of using instead of having the vehicle to uh, install with the external speaker because the smartphone also has its own speaker. So in this turn, we can actually have the speaker, the smartphone itself to emit the acoustic sound and then to receive the bounced off signals and try to uh, detect the moving status of the vehicles nearby. So in this case, we don't need, uh, we don't need the assistance from the uh, external speaker that is installed at the vehicles. Um, so this is still something that we are working on, uh, but there are still some restrictions for the idea that I just mentioned. Uh, first of all, the ranging distance at this solution may be reduced uh, because the decaying coefficient of acoustic sound is high, is uh, relatively higher than other uh, radio waves, for example. So how we can effectively extend the ranging, the ranging distance if we use both the speaker and the microphone on the speaker on the smartphone to, to, to do the detection is a, is a challenging. So one potential solution is instead of using the acoustic signals, we may switch to the uh, radio frequency, the radios, the, like using the uh, Wi-Fi radio, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, radio to do the same thing. So this is another potential solution. Uh, this is something that we are working on. Um, and regarding the second part of the question, whether we can integrate other types of sensors like uh, cameras to do the uh, to do the detection, that answer is definitely yes. That answer is definitely yes. Um, different sensing modality have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for a camera, its advantage is that um, it can have a better um, like resolution of the object captured. It can even tell whether what, what, what type of car it is or what kind of obstacles it is. Um, however, the side effect is that if we are using the camera, then its detection performance will be significantly reduced in the darkness, for example, in the evening or at night. So I would guess it's a, it's a very good approach that if we can combine diverse sensors on the smartphone um, to achieve the same goal, to achieve the same task, 
that can leverage, we can harness the advantage of both the sensory modes or even other types of uh, sensing, um, sensing techniques. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, since this is an acoustic based system, uh, is background noise uh, a, a problem of particularly in noisy areas? OK, uh, thanks for this question. Um, so first of all, our tool operates um, at the acoustic range between 17 kilohertz to 19 kilohertz. Um, and uh, we actually did some um, investigation, some frequency analysis over some common background noise, including the, uh, the human voice or the uh, construction noise, the noise from the truck or other kinds of vehicles. And after the analysis, we find that for the frequency of those background noise, they mainly, uh, they mainly locate at the lower end of the frequency band, uh, specifically even lower than 10 kilohertz, the major part, the major part of those background noise. Um, since I've said the operation uh, frequency of the sound of our tool is between 17 kilohertz and 19 kilohertz, then if we can apply a high pass filter, we can easily field out filled out those background noise, which mainly resides lower than 10 kilohertz. So in this way, we can eliminate the impact from the background noise. Yes, um, actually uh, uh, in this system architecture, in this slide, I actually, uh, we, here is one module. Uh, this, the first module here is noise abstraction. So this is exactly what we intend to do here, just to, uh, filter out the background noise that uh, basically resides on the lower end of the frequency. And thanks for the question. Lynn, you're muted. I'm muted. I am very sorry. <laughs> Good. Uh, for students who are listening, um, what courses or areas of study would you recommend for students who are interested in studying uh, your project or other assistive technologies? Okay, um, so in computer science and engineering, we uh, we offered both the undergraduate and the graduate level courses for this. Uh, what you can take, we, we offer the IoT for uh, IoT course for the undergraduate level, and for me this semester I offered a graduate level uh, special topic course also on IoT. Um, and in these courses, the students have the uh, are exposed to hands-on experiments. Uh, you are going to play with some IoT devices and even the smartphone build your own. Uh, smartphone applications and to resolve many um, and to explore many interesting novel applications of IoT in the domain of uh, uh, smart city, uh, smart health, uh, and so on. And beyond that, um, a couple of faculty members in our department also offer the uh, uh, human computer interaction um, and uh, uh, assistive technology. I, I think one or two professors actually offer special topics on assistive uh, technology. Um, and uh, even computer vision is another related topic. Um, actually, the computer science department offers diverse courses uh, in this area. Um, so you can definitely take a look at the course list that we have. Yeah, and by the way, um, so um, right now I'm I'm actively looking for undergraduate and uh, graduate students who are interested in working uh, related research topics like this and many others. So if you have interest and you believe you have the necessary background, you are very encouraged to contact me. Very nice and what a nice way to wrap this up. We're almost out of time. 
Uh, if anybody has any other questions for Dr. Lee, this would be a, a really good time to uh, to to pose them. I did want to ask one other uh, whether you are uh, at this point recruiting human subjects for this uh, this topic or are you more in the development stage yet? Uh, Right now, we are doing the experiment uh, mostly with the uh, student in my lab. Um, this is what we have, but if we are expanding the, the scale of the experiment, uh, we will definitely uh, try to get some permits from the university for mm -hmm. involving human subjects. Very good. Um, on, on a personal note, my mother had uh, was legally blind for the last about 20 years of her life and did amazingly well under the, the circumstances, but uh, some of the th techniques that are being developed now are just ones that, that I feel would be so effective uh, if, if she were here to take advantage of it. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Sure. So, uh, let me see if we have anything yet to to do. I'd I'd like to just ask how you got interested in the project. Uh, you mean uh, yeah. why I choose? Just, yeah, how you picked this as your area of research? Yeah. So. Uh, my research interests include um, IoT, mobile computing, and I'm very interested in exploring their novel applications in smart health, smart city, smart living, and so on. Um, and uh, so um, for how to, so I actually mentioned one sentence in the slides. So nowadays, people are talking about autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. Actually, those vehicles are equipped with very advanced techniques to avoid collision. Um, um, however, these techniques um, cannot be readily applied to the pedestrian side. Um, and uh, given the advanced techniques that we got for the vehicles, the the blind people still mostly use the sticks, wood sticks or plastics or the guide cane or with the systems with um, guidance dogs to move around. So I observe a huge gap between these two. Um, and uh, given the advanced technology that we already have um, in IoT, in mobile computing, and also computer vision and things like that. Can we convert or channel some of those techniques to this domain to improve the living quality, the mobility of this group of people? So that's why I'm very interested in uh, this topic. Thank you so much. And what a nice way to conclude our presentation for today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for participating today. Uh, we would like to remind you that this session was recorded. It will be available on the uh, UTA engineering website um, for replay. And also on that website, you will find the uh, catalog of other opportunities. Every Friday, we want to remind you that there is a, either a faculty or an industry partner or alum presentation um, in, in a research area that is, that is focused on a general interest topic. Um, there are a number of other uh, presentations, actually one every day, some more focused on student interests and some more focused on uh, publicly available presentations, as this one is. Uh, this one was advertised to our alums, to our industry partners, and to those that we thought would be interested in it. 
So again, thank you all for presenting um, your questions. Thanks to Dr. Lee for her presentation today. And that concludes the virtual brown bag for today. Thanks. Thank you.